I, you know, I'm the kind of guy I just say yes, even though I'm not really sure I can do it. I learned that from my father. My father came from Thailand. He was an Air Force sergeant in, in Thailand, and he was not trained as a cook, but he came here and he got a job at a diner. And the whole thing was that he kind of went in there and they, they went, do you know how to cook? And he went, yes. And the whole thing was, the thing he taught me was that like, you're either going to learn fast and you have a job or you don't learn fast enough and you get fired, right? But right now you don't have a job. So just say yes and figure it out. Hello and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, brought to you by the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be hearing from violinist and composer Earl Money In. Earl is a classically trained violinist who received a Bachelor of Music from Queens College and a Master of Music from the Manus School of Music, where he studied with Daniel Phillips of the Orion String Quartet. But you're not likely to find Earl playing with an orchestra. What he loves is to lend his considerable violin chops to hardcore music, to the sounds of heavy metal and punk. He's built quite a reputation as a hardcore violinist. None other than Robert Trujillo, bassist for Metallica, has called him a kick-ass artist who pushes the creative boundaries. Earl is the founder and main composer for the string quartet Seven Sons, which was formed to play extreme chamber music by remixing metal and hardcore songs on strings. Seven Sons also plays original works. The music you're hearing is one such piece. It's a track titled Malice, that Earl composed with contributions from his first heavy metal band, Resolution 15. And it's on Seven Sons' album, For the Heart Still Beating. As a composer, Earl has received commissions from a broad array of individuals and institutions, from internationally renowned violinist Rachel Barton Pine and pioneering hardcore band The Dillinger Escape Plan, to Dance Theater of Harlem and the Phoenix Symphony which incidentally is conducted by a past Art Restart guest, Tito Munoz. Earl spoke to me from his home in Brooklyn. I started by asking him which came first in his musical education, his love of metal or of the violin? Wow. I guess, I guess violin first, because, you know, they, they, you know, they kind of stick you in there with little, at least for me, I did not have a choice in the matter, but I ended up really loving it. Right. But, um, they, my, my parents kind of put me in like at four, you know, with the Cracker Jack box and the, and the dowel. And you don't really have, you know, you, you don't really have a choice in the, it's kind of one of these things that like a bunch of kids, there's this attrition, right? Like all these kids like kind of end up hating it and quit. And I actually didn't, I really loved it. So I kind of stuck with it and I discovered metal when I was, Oh God, how old was I? Like, in sixth grade or fifth grade, something like this, some kid passed me a tape of, uh, I think, Master of Puppets. It was, it was, and also it's the neighborhood I grew up in too. But that's a little later. I think Metallica kind of came first, and then in my neighborhood is it, it was all like underground hardcore punk shows and stuff. Like all my friends, kind of, we went to like these all ages shows in in uh, in like VFW halls and church basements and stuff. So I'm guessing that as you were studying on the violin, you were playing a classical repertoire and you were going to hear these punk bands on your own. At what point did you think, hey, wait a minute, I can bring my violin skills to this genre? That's an interesting question, man, because I think I think the real realization, like I am going to use this as kind of like not use. I'm going to draw on that as a large part of like my artistic face or identity or whatever it is. Like that didn't come until like way later, right? Oh. Way later. But I definitely was playing violin and figuring out like Slayer solos and like Metallica solos, like 
in high school and just kind of like trying to figure it out and then like, oh, hey, look, this is the solo from Orion on the violin kind of a thing. But also remember that this is like 1990. So, you know, like, so I don't know. I, I just it didn't occur to me, you know, at all. It was just like two schizophrenic, very separate worlds that like I had my friends that were like hardcore kids and metalheads. Right. Because also I came up at the first time when metal and punk, they used to hate each other. Like nobody really remembers this anymore, I think. But like metalheads and punks used to totally hate each other. This was like violent fights would break out at shows. And I was like the first generation where it was like starting to kind of come together. Like there was like this crossover where like, you know, punk bands would use metal riffs and they they would still totally have a DIY like sort of punk ethic. Like it was, you know, there was an, I, I heard a thing on NPR the other day where I was like, oh, my God, that dude nailed it. He was a, a a part of the queer punk uh, scene like in Washington. And he was like talking about how metal is more anger outward and punk is more anger inward. And I thought that was pretty on, on point. Like it was a lot of metal is sort of like, I'm a God, worship me. Look at my guitar solo. I'm so awesome. Like virtuosic kind of a thing, which has its parallels with certain aspects of classical uh, violin playing, I think, interestingly enough. And then punk is more like I suffer and I know you suffer. To, I suffer. We look, let, let's let's catharsis sort of suffer together. You know, this kind of a personal it's a more personal kind of expression than and, and we're all the same kind of thing. It's much more egalitarian in that way. We are we are coming together, kind of like express this feeling together. And I and and whereas the performer and the and the and the and the uh, the audience kind of blend into one, it's like this communal experience in punk. And metal is more like the performer is on the stage and is a god or a goddess. And so, which of the two you said you were going to both? Was there one, whether in terms of your taste or your playing, that you were natu- more naturally drawn to? Well, I think because I grew up in the crossover, I've always been much more at heart, like a punk in terms of like this communal, I don't like it when people get like, like, I've never liked the more extreme aspects of showmanship for the sake of showmanship, you know, regardless of genre. I don't, yeah, I don't like Yngwie Malmsteen. I don't like Dragon Force. I don't like these bands, a dream theater that are kind of like, you know, Monday in the space of, you know, Tuesday and Thursday for no reason. And, (laughs) You know, and similarly, I don't like violinists who do this either. I don't like hyphets, actually. Like, I don't like these players that are kind of like, look how awesome I am with nothing to say. But I also love virtuosity, but I want a reason, if that makes any. I don't know if I'm being clear. Like, yeah. You, you know, yeah, no, we're going to, I'm we're totally going to come back to that. The reason. Yeah, the reason. Uh, so, yeah. so, so at what point you say it came much later, this idea of, making of bringing your violin skills to this genre when did that happen because you have you you have many years of training right yeah unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) um that's uh, i guess the first inkling well so i was in a hippie band i dropped out of school i dropped out of undergrad like my junior year and then i toured the country with this jam band and that was like so not metal at all but I convinced the guy. So that was was that your first kind of professional violin gig, though? I guess so. So it was we a were, big deal. We were paid for it, and right. we were like a D minus, famous level. Like we, you know, there were hordes of hippies sort of there. So I guess yeah, and we were paid for it. So I guess yeah, I got you know what? I, it had never occurred to me to think of it that way. But yeah, sure, yes, yes, Pierre. So I was playing the violin in this rock band, and I learned a lot. Right. I really learned a lot, but it wasn't metal. It was like so far from the scene that I grew up in. And I had fallen into it because of uh, friends that I had in college. You know, I just kind of went along with it. But I convinced the guys who were not metalheads, I remember convincing them to play War Pigs, the Black Sabbath song. I had a five string violin at the time. And, you know, now I have a seven because I realized I wanted lower ranges, but I had a five string violin at the time. I was playing everything an octave above. Tony Iommi, but it still kind of made sense. And I was doing the riffs and it, I, I, we had a, we got a great, you know, reception when we would cover the song and, 
you know, and I loved it. And I think that was the first inkling of that. Hey, I can actually riff on a violin. I mean, I know all the riffs. I've listened to it since I was like a baby, basically. And like, I know them. So why not? That was the first inkling. And then later on, when I graduated, when I got out of grad school, I think that's when I really started doing it. I realized I wanted, you know, um, I okay, so that's interesting. So you you're playing in this jam band, this hippie jam band. You're starting to really think about using your skills towards the genre that you like, and then you you finish your schooling and you go to grad school. What? Why? Why did you go to grad school? What were you hoping to keep learning in grad school? I wanted to hone my technique. I think. How do I explain this? I'm one of those kids, you know, how like some teachers, like there's this, you know, there's, everybody has different gifts. Everybody has different strengths, right? I had spent a long time relying on native, just sort of, I was never one of these kids. It sounds so arrogant, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. I was never, I never really had to struggle learning the violin. I was just kind of good always. And it sounds terrible, but that's just how it is. I was always rather good and I never really worked at it. So, but the, the, the truth is, is that, so you get, because you have native ability, you can go so far and then you can kind of lean on it. But if you really want something, ultimately, I think you're going to have to work, you know, no matter what your native ability is, if you're really trying to go for a certain thing that you're really passionate about, that you hear it, you really want to do the job right. I think ultimately, no matter who you are, you kind of have to, there's a moment where you kind of have to buckle down and work. And so what, what were you going for? I wanted to not feel restricted in my instrument. And I think I was getting to a point when I was in the jam band and when I was doing these things, and it didn't really take too much skill toll or psychic toll on me. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but like I, it never really took, it, I never really had to work too hard. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like, but, but at the same time, could I toss off Paganini 24 with, with, with no effort? The answer is no. And I kind of wanted to get there. You know, I wanted that skill and I felt, I was like, you know what? Now it's time to cut the crap and it's time to work. So that's why I wanted to go back to grad school because I wanted to sort of really be brutally honest in terms of where my skill was and what I wanted. What kind of career had you envisioned for yourself when you were starting out? I didn't. Like, you didn't? I didn't. I, I All I knew was I definitely did not want to be an orchestra player. That was like, oh, oh my God, that was like one of the most painful, hateful experiences. So that, but then you're in grad school and I'm guessing that most of your fellow students wanted to be orchestral players probably and all your teachers were so how did you keep a level head through that process knowing that 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 wasn't your goal well i was older already Pierre. I, so remember i was i was touring the country with this hippie jam band right and by the time i was in grad school i started when i was 24 so i know to me now as a 45 year old dude that sounds like oh what a baby cutie pie <laughs> oh a cutie pie the 24 year old oh it's cute you know like but i was already a little older than than a lot of the, my a lot of my peers in grad school, and I already had seen a lot, and I knew exactly what I wanted. Like I even made like a little checklist. The checklist was really understand. I actually I think I wrote it down somewhere. I was like really 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 understand intimately violin technique. Like what are your goals in grad school? Like it was a really 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 silly list. I think it came down to like three things. It came down to like hone your technique mercilessly, have a good time and make a lot of friends and make out with a lot of girls. I think those are my three. And goals. You, you were able to check all three, I all presume. Three. All oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So it, it all worked out, but, <laughs> but yeah, so. No, I love that you have the making, making a lot of friends is crucial because of course you've, you've created several bands, at least two bands. And that, you have to know how to bring together collaborators, right? Yeah. Yes. I think my main beef with orchestral playing is that, I mean, maybe other people have, again, I'm open to the idea that like, like my earlier statements, like I'm open to the idea that other people have had wildly different experiences than mine, but I've always thought like my orchestral experiences were always kind of uptight. 
in a certain way. There was no real like, or if it was, there were there was friendship making. It was it was always outside of the context of the rehearsal. I'm not saying that. Oh yeah, you can't be friends with people in orchestra. That's not true. It's obviously not true. Just in terms of the 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 vibe of an orchestra rehearsal is fairly joyless, at least my experience. When did you realize you had composing talent? Ah, I guess I was always writing. I was writing for my band, right? I was even writing for the hippie band, but that was a little difficult because it wasn't like I'm not a jam band guy naturally. So that was a little weird writing sort of nice major songs that in pentatonic major that kind of, you know, um, but I did. I wrote a couple uh, but I was writing tunes even like in my high school. I had a high school punk band called Dogs Without Fur. And, <laughs> you know, me and my buddy wrote a supremely stupid song called Cookie Monster Eats Cookies because it's the most redundant thing, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I was writing stuff and I was definitely writing things in, in, in high school and whatever. Rachel Barton Pine asked me to write. She was a fan of my metal band that I had started after graduate school, Resolution 15. And we all knew her because she's a, I use the word conditionally famous, right? Because I don't really know what famous means anymore. But within classical music, she's a famous violinist. And everybody knows who she, I, like I didn't know she knew me, but she was kind of like secretly a fan of my band. So she cold called me one day and having gotten my number from like a friend of a friend of a friend and uh, asked me if I would write her a solo piece, sort of Yizai inspired and but like like coming from the uh from the histories of like you know like the predecessors of Yizai and and Bach you know would she write me a kind of extreme or heavy music inspired solo violin piece so i you know i'm the kind of guy i just say yes even though i'm not really sure i can do it <laughs> i learned that from my father my father came from thailand he was an air force sergeant in in thailand and he was not trained as a cook, but he came here and he got a job at a diner. And the whole thing was that he kind of went in there and they they went, do you know how to cook? And he went, yes. And the whole thing was the thing he taught me was that like you're either going to learn fast and you have a job or you don't learn fast enough and you get fired. Right. But right now you don't have a job. So just say yes and figure it out. So you learn fast and compose. How long did it take you to compose that first piece? About a month kind of like throwing ideas out there and then kind of throwing it away and then, you know, and then trying it out myself and then hating it and then throwing it away, all that stuff. So, um, and is this a piece that Rachel was planning to perform in concert venues, concert yes. halls? Okay. Yes. Completely within the, the, the predecessors of Yizai. So it could stand. So, so I guess on the classical or more, you know, the classical side of things, that's kind of where my music stands. I ended up writing a violin concerto for her too, of the same kind of feel where like, I didn't incorporate any kind of extra stuff. Like there's no like, oh, we need to bring in an expert. We need to bring in a drummer or we need to bring in, a, you know, a pedals or incorporate sort of more modern things. Like the, the piece that I wrote for her or the pieces that I write for her could be played in 1920 but with brought in with sort of like a punk feel like the aggression, the, the, some of the musical language that I felt could translate. We like to talk about systemic changes on this podcast. Mm. So what do you think could or should change from the educational to the professional level to make it easier for cross genre musicians like you to thrive? Oh God. That, what a, that, that's a great question, man. So that's an, actually an argument that I got into with my wife. Not really an argument, but, you know, a heated discussion. Because my original stance, Pierre, was like, I'm like, you know, these conservatories don't teach squat. That like kind of, you know, if you can envision, envision the sort of old man on the rocking chair, the whole get off my lawn kind of thing. You know, like they don't teach them about EQing. They don't need to teach them about like recording. Uh, you know, they were, I, I had said I was really annoyed in the way that like, when the pandemic happened, I got all these sudden messages from people like, I borrowed this Neumann microphone and I don't know where to plug it into my violin, you know, and you go, dude, really? You know, and so where I was like, well, the school should teach that sort of thing, you know, like all this kind of like bitching, you know, about stuff. And then my wife was like, you know, 
a solid liberal arts education should should make it so you don't need any of that specific you're not going to school for like it's, it's not like you're not going to apex tech you're not learning to actually be a mechanic right so maybe it's more important that people are learning how to be inquisitive how to be more you know open minded and ask the right questions so that they when when they enter a situation that is kind of foreign to them they kind of have the critical thinking skills to figure it out themselves so i thought what she said was actually pretty pretty awesome um, but but who won the argument? Do you think? <laughs> I think the answer is in the middle. Okay. But well, ha- having thought of it, it's neither this nor that. I think I kind of moved back from my earlier assertion that like they should be teaching this, they should be teaching this, they should be teaching this. But at the other hand, I would like to see. It's funny because it's inherent in the word conservatories. Be less conservative in that. Like so, when I was at school, I wanted to take a jazz class, and I was actually not allowed to. Hmm. which I thought was super weird and interesting, but not, not Queens college. When I was at grad school, when I was at uh Manus. What about, so you mentioned the pandemic earlier on and the pandemic clearly showed that the life of a professional musician can be very precarious. Hmm. What did it teach you about what might change to make that, that kind of a career less precarious? Um, I think what, helped me personally during the pandemic and I know helped other people too was the ability to remote record I mentioned the 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 the, the person who didn't know what to do with a Neumann before but other people did I know a lot of my friends and colleagues got good work and were able to stay afloat when everything shut down because it's not like the human need for music goes away but it has to get diverted into other things, right? So maybe there were more TV shows that needed backing, you know, like needed, you know, a, a horn or needed, you know, whatever, whatever musical input they needed that. And so I know I got my jobs. My wife and I were really saved through a big remote recording job. We did the whole, we did this Netflix show, uh, Waffles and Mochi. We did the whole season just in my in my uh, in my studio here at home. Oh and wow, so you scored the whole show from your home studio. I didn't score it. We were given midis of string lines and I had to transcribe them just by ear because it's not worth it to sit there with like the paper because the deadlines are too fast. I guess that's a skill set, right? Like Yes, you, definitely. You had to hear what was going on and just like replicate it. Like you don't there's no time to like sit there with Sibelius and write down what it was. You just had to like hear it, record it six times in a row so it sounds like a whole orchestra, and then move on to the next thing. I know that saved me and my wife. Like our, I was really freaked out. I remembered like the mortgage was continuing to come, but my jobs weren't, <laughs> you know? So when that job came in, that was a real lifesaver. I definitely know friends of mine had very similar experiences where the ones who knew how to remote record, the ones who knew how to kind of like adapt into this uh, brave new world, ended up doing okay. Yeah, it kind of makes me think that, in fact, some of that might be taught in school. <laughs> right. No, I mean th- that's why I mean. You know, like, in fact, I for this for this podcast, I interviewed en- Enrique Marquez, who's the music music director at Interlochen, mm. and those high school students are learning like big time classical technique. But there's also a recording studio, and they learn how to do everything you're talking about. I love that. Is that amazing? Is amazing. That's amazing. That makes me so happy that they they learn how to record that because it, it just gives you more tools. There is that middle ground, right? I don't think it's because it, it, also what my the, the point that my wife had brought up, which I thought really resonated and I kind of walked back my earlier thought is because technology is constantly changing, right? Like it's always new. So you can't make this dogmatic formulate program that addresses the needs of specifically 2022 because that's not going to it'll be obsolete in in 5 years there's going to be some new stuff that comes out that's amazing and all the stuff that you learned in your class you know is going to be obsolete but there's a middle ground too right like so all the kids knowing how to record themselves that's beautiful that's how it should be so imagine that you are about to receive a significant no strings attached commission what do you think you'd compose and where would you like it to be premiered? A significant no strings attached. 
commission. And it can be premiered anywhere in any type of venue, anywhere in the world. Oh, man. Okay. So, and I could bring friends into it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, so I almost had it, but like, I think because of the pandemic and like all this stuff and and real life, it kind of is not going to happen, but I already almost had my dream thing. So, uh, so I'll just say this. So I think I would like to write, I don't, I'm not clear on what it would be. It would be like maybe a 45 minute sort of musical, I hate the word, but I don't have a better one right now. Journey. <laughs> What a terrible word. I hate that word so much, but whatever uh, that, but incorporating, incorporating a symphonic orchestra, but also incorporating my friend, the drummer of the band, Mashuga, Thomas Hack. Hack. I'm going to mispronounce his name. See, it's a Swedish, I don't know. Everybody has different cultures. I'm sorry, Thomas. Anyway, so him and my friend, Jess, Jess Pimentel, the, 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 she's an actress and spoken word with electric violins and just like a whole big work that incorporates extreme music and classical music, but not in the way that like they've done it in the past. Like, no, you know, like, like Metallica's S and M who I, you know, where I thought it was amazing for what it was, but it was basically just metal band piled on top of orchestra. I would have neither could exist without the other. Like it would be a completely integrated piece of music where it all kind of depended on everything else. And I would love to premiere that at like Hellfest and then also like the Royal Albert Hall. That would be the, that would be like, I don't know, that's, that's a little bit random, but that would be like the, uh, whoa, that's super cool kind of a thing. I have to say that it's like Monday in the space of Tuesday and Thursday has become my favorite expression, even though I'm not sure what it means. I was going to ask Earl, but actually some things should remain wrapped in mystery, I think. Hey, heads up if you live in or near New York City. Seven Sons is playing a show at the Cell Theater in Chelsea on March 27th. The show is titled Plague Year Lullabies, and I'm guessing these lullabies won't be for babies. You're subscribed to Art Restart, right? If not, click that subscribe or follow button so you don't miss any upcoming interviews. If you'd like to learn more about Earl and read a longer version of this interview, please head to uncsa.edu slash art restart. Thanks to Earl for letting us use excerpts of Malice. You can find the album for The Heart Still Beating wherever you get your music. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Pier Carlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Keenan Institute for the Arts, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>